I'm here with Aki Fujimoro of DQS, who's going to talk today about the petaflop computing era. Aki, we've seen um, enormous amounts of data flowing through these days, and it seems to be accelerating in terms of uh, how much data there actually is. Are there, there are more sensors everywhere. What do you see driving this? Well, part of it is the ability to do it, and the other part of it is the demand to do so, I think. And so uh, uh, definitely deep learning and the ability of deep learning to analyze so much data automatically using uh, taking advantage basically of the computer's ability to tirelessly work the data. Um, humans get tired, but machines don't, right? And uh, uh, I think that is a huge breakthrough in how the society can use computing to its advantage um, in a way that uh, we haven't been able to do, we weren't able to do 10 years ago. So there, there are several key moving pieces here. So for years, actually for half a century, we saw Moore's law where you double the number of transistors every 18 to 24 months. The problem is that now we're not getting those same kind of benefits every time we double the number of transistors. The uh, performance is not 50% anymore. It's now somewhere around the range of 20% at each new node. The number of uh, transistors that you can pack out to a die is, is coming into... Uh, running into problems in terms of how do we actually fit all these things on there. There's more data to process from all these sensors, and there's all these new markets that are adding in semiconductors. What is that doing from the standpoint of how do we make these chips, how do we manufacture them, and how do we keep up? Yeah, you're right. That Moore's law certainly has slowed down, but unlike what people used to say 10 years ago, where most laws just no longer needed. Um, computers, you know, CPUs are fast enough. Uh, there's no way to use any more uh, uh, power. You know, that's what people, I, I heard a lot of discussions like that 10 years ago, but we don't hear that anymore. Um, uh, these days, I think uh, uh, the semiconductor industry and the users of semiconductor technology um, has uh, bifurcated in, in essence. Uh, you know, they've decided that there is a segment of the semiconductor population that uh, 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 will be okay with uh, 22 nanometer or scaling slower uh, uh, for IoT, uh, internet of things and other devices like that, where it is true that uh, uh, computers or you know, chips are fast enough and uh, you can do plenty of things and uh, the creativity comes from uh, what sensors or you know what other things you combine with it and what software you use to drive them. Um, but there is a, a distinct segment that needs supercomputing and uh, uh, the, uh, the demand for more and more compute power uh, for any given dollar or any given uh, uh, square feet or any given uh, power, you know that, like, that, that all, all of that, uh, is uh, uh, really insatiable at this point. Uh, uh, you know, D2S does GPU computing for the semiconductor industry, and we um, uh, we can see how we can use ten times as much as we have now. Um, you know, if we had ten times as much today, we take advantage of that. And uh, uh, deep learning is the other thing. You know, deep learning uh, really, really showed people how one can use what I call useful, uh, useful waste uh, to be able to leverage uh, more and more compute power and be able to do things that weren't possible before. So um, I think people um, went through a little bit of a period 10 years ago where they went, I don't know how we can use this stuff, right? Um, to uh, figuring out uh, how we can use this stuff and also economically uh, bifurcating, basically deciding that uh, some of the semiconductor demand is just going to be uh, staying at the Internet of Things, IoT kinds of nodes. Um, but uh, there is going to be a much more expensive, but worth it uh, kind of uh, supercomputing that is going to continue to drive. I think a part of it, you mentioned the scaling. It, it, it's definitely true that clock speed is no longer scaling, right? Yeah. You know, we uh, don't see. Uh, 
uh, uh, CPUs with 10 gigahertz, like it, it might be if it continued to scale because it's been, uh, you know, three gigahertz, notching up to four gigahertz um, over the last 10 years. But what has not slowed down is uh, SIMD or uh, single instruction multiple data bit width uh, scaling. So um, you have uh, certain types of computer programs that are written to take advantage of a different kind of an architecture than what people call the von Neumann kind of an architecture uh, or uh, uh, you know, the old style IBM mainframe kind of architecture, right? Where you have a, a single instruction basically working on a set of data and another set of instructions working on another set of data, either on the same chip or on different chips. Uh, there's a new kind of uh, computer, well, it's not really new, but uh, uh, newly inspired uh, you know, kind of computing that is more single instruction multiple data where uh, the uh, same set of instructions are operating on multiple set of data at the same time. And the latest uh, uh, GPUs from NVIDIA, for example, have over 5,000 such processors where the 5,000 uh, processors uh, execute the same instructions for the most part. And they have clever things to manipulate that a little bit, but that uh, for the most part, uh, you know, all 5,000 uh, uh, processors are uh, uh, executing the same instructions, but the data is different. And it turns out that's exactly how nature works, right? Um, you know, when you have uh, physics or chemistry acting on different part, different parts of the world, like weather simulation, right? The physics that works on uh, weather is exactly the same everywhere, right? But the data is different. What's next to you is different. What land is different, right? Air is different. Temperature is different. The humidity is different, right? And that is. Um, what's driving the complex behavior that we see and for simulating nature like that or semi, uh, uh, simulating the effects of semiconductor manufacturing, it turns out, um, SIMD uh, works out to be a, a, a perfectly good way to scale as long as you write the software in that way. So Aki, going back uh, even a few years, this looked like science fiction. Uh, and we really didn't measure things in petaflops, right? We, we were using different kinds of measurements in terms of performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I uh, uh, started, I moved to California after school. Uh, I came to work for Trilogy, uh, which was doing a, a wafer scale integration, actually, for um, IBM mainframe, compatible mainframe. And uh, its goal was to do 35 MIPS, right? And 35 MIPS squared is less than this amount, right? So, uh, you know, MIPS and uh, flops are not uh, apples and apples, but still, um, uh, you know, it's a huge number. You know, there are 14 zeros here um, followed, uh, uh, following one eight, right? So um, it, it's, a, it's a huge amount of computing power, uh, 1,800 teraflops or 1, 800 thousand gigaflops, right, is uh, floating point uh, instructions per second is what flops is. So um, it's, a, it's a huge amount. And, um, you know, a, a teraflops or petaflops now uh, is being uh, used mostly for the SIMD type of computing, single instruction multiple data. So uh, uh, GPUs are usually measured and it's speed by that. And uh, it uh, reflects the uh, number of processors that uh, there is and also the clock speed that each of those processors are running at. But uh, being able to have one chip, uh, you know, that has a, a huge amount of computing power, and then 1.8 petaflops is uh, a whole bunch of those GPUs put together in one single rack uh, that uh, we just announced uh, uh, our computational design platform uh, that has this characteristic uh, exactly in um, one, rack of computer, we get 1.8 petaflops now. Just amazing. What's the impact in terms of the back end as we get into the manufacturing side? What do you deal with in terms of the photo mass, which is, has been one of the bottlenecks in the past? The computing based on uh, a bit with uh, benefit, like having many, many processors and being able to take 
uh, take advantage of that requires a different kind of software uh, from the kinds of software that's traditionally been developed in the past. Um, and uh, uh, by taking advantage of the SIMD architecture and programming to that, uh, we uh, at D2S are able to uh, benefit the mask manufacturing community as well as the wafer manufacturing community uh, to be able to um, compute more accurately, uh, fast enough uh, to be useful. So we can do faster computation than if you were uh, exclusively on CPUs um, and we can produce uh, results that are more accurate because of the power of the GPU. So uh, we do two different kinds of things. Uh, one, uh, we create the mask shapes by optimizing wafer performance in uh, uh, by manipulating the mask shapes. That's called um, OPC optical proximity correction or the advanced version of that is called the uh, inverse lithography techno uh, technologies, ILT. ILT uh, is a, a product that we have uh, that creates actually uniquely curved linear uh, mask shapes, uh, which uh, uh, is able to uh, uniquely produce superior wafer performance. And then we also have software that takes those curved linear shapes that are output and uh, be able to uh, produce that on a mask because mask uh, uh, production uh, also uh, requires some uh, manipulation to get the mask to look exactly like the mask design that you wanted. Uh, the mask, uh, that manipulation process uh, using software is called the mask process correction, MPC. And uh, we also have MPC software that takes advantage of uh, GPU acceleration. And in particular, on the uh, nuclear MBM 2000, uh, there's a capability called PLDC, uh, pixel level dose correction, uh, that is basically uh, inline form of uh, in line, meaning it uh, runs along with the machine. As the machine writes, it's doing the correction so that there is no additional runtime required. And that is also uniquely enabled by GPU acceleration. So why do you need the curvilinear? Is it a matter of things don't print the same way they used to? Is it the uh, size of that? Is it the fact that uh, we're now using different customized types of structures in there? Two things, really. Um, one side of it is that when you produce something uh, physical on the mask or uh, particularly on the wafer, everything is curvilinear. There's no such thing as a 90 degree corner in nature because that takes infinite energy to create it. So, um, so everything is curvilinear, but it was close enough um, you know, when we were talking about uh, 130 nanometer, it was close enough that you didn't really have to worry about the difference. The, the corner rounding was very little compared to the area of uh, area you were trying to expose. But um, nowadays, when we're talking about uh, five nanometer now, you know, going into three nanometer, even looking into two nanometer, uh, it's uh, it, it that's that's no longer the case. And um, on the wafer. Uh, even back in um, uh, you know 22 nanometer, um, uh, if you try to draw a square as a contact, or you know all design shapes look like squares. Um, uh, if you did that on the wafer, they were all circles, and everybody knew that, so they were compensating for that, right? They do they would draw a square, but uh, they knew that it would turn into a circle. So you're right. There is definitely one aspect of it, which is uh, drawing rectangles as things you want on a uh, wafer or on a mask is pretending that you can get that, knowing, in fact, everybody knows that it's not possible, right? Um, there are things that go wrong because of that. And uh, uh, in fact, there's been uh, several papers that's proven that uh, Manufacturing reliability, uh, resilience to manufacturing variation is uh, significantly improved if you target shapes that are in fact manufacturable. So if you try to uh, target a shape that's not possible, like a square or a 90 degree corner, um, then you're not going to be as reliable like, you know, it's not gonna be repeatable. Every time you print one, it's gonna be slightly different and it's gonna be more different than if you try to target a shape that's actually possible to manufacture like a circle or, an, uh, uh, you know, an ellipse or something like that. So you want to have curvilinear shapes as target 
if uh, resilience to variation is important and it's increasingly important nowadays. So that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it is that if you target curvilinear shapes on the mask, then wafer performance has long been known to be far superior. So you can make the wafer resilience to manufacturing variation much, much better and therefore improve wafer yield substantially by having curvilinear shapes on mask. And that's only been recently uh, enabled. By getting this accuracy, which is really what you're doing, you're improving the accuracy here in terms of what gets printed. Do you now, are you now able to say, okay, we can reduce the margin that needs to go into this in the process as well as in the design, because now you have much more accurate printing of the shapes that are actually there. Yes, that, that was the first aspect that, uh, yeah, it, uh, if you target manufacturable shapes, then your result is going to be much more reliable. You're going to be much more repeatable in pr printing the same area or in the same contour uh, every time. The flip side of that is because you have much more accuracy, now you can start designing these chips to actually hit what your target here of how many petaflops you're trying to get to in terms of performance, right? Because what you've done is say, okay, we don't have to now create all this margin that's going to impact power and performance. Now we can, we can design this exactly the way it's going to print. Yeah, that's definitely an impact on design that um, uh, we hope uh, is going to be the downstream effect of uh, this kind of an improvement. And you're right, in order to get the 1.8 uh, petaflops, we need uh, uh, GPUs. And in order to get the 18 petaflops, which we would love um, you know, in the next couple of years, and uh, uh, we, we want to have the GPUs and CPUs and every other uh, semiconductor device at the leading edge uh, be able to continue to scale. And uh, in order to do that, more and more, uh, it's exactly what you said. What's important is to be able to count on that when you manufacture something, it's going to be relatively safe. And, you know, that, that standard deviation uh, is uh, very tight. We want the deviation to be as tight as possible in manufacturing, because if it's not very tight, then design uh, has to take account for the possibility that it might be this slow, and the possibility that it might be this fast. And you have to do that for every single delay path. And uh, when you combine them all together, you end up with way, way too much divergence in the process corners that you have to account for. So um, uh, being able to be tighter in manufacturing has huge implications uh, in design too. So Aki, when do we get to this number? How far away are we from this? Is this a matter of progression and we're going there or is it a matter of this is what we need right now? 1.8 uh, petaflops is the number for a one rack computational design platform, CDP, that uh, we announced just recently. So it's here today. We can do, uh, we're, we're, we can ship uh, 1.8 petaflops, one rack computer today. So um, the question is, uh, when can we get to 18? Because we surely could use that, that you know, really seriously. And um, uh, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't see the scaling slowing down because how we get to 1.8 petaflops to begin with is by bit width scaling, not by clock speed scaling, right? And we think that we can uh, contribute to semiconductor manufacturing, including GPUs and CPUs, where uh, we can get them to run faster clock speed, um, uh, uh, leveraging our technologies. Um, so, so we think that we could do that, but that's not even being counted on in this calculation. 1.8 petaflops is what we can do today. And we, uh, uh, we think that we will continue to uh, be able to scale uh, in terms of uh, you know, GPUs and CPUs that we count on. Uh, and memory and uh, you know uh, communication devices and all those are uh, extremely important too. Um, uh, I think those things are going to continue to scale. Aki Fujimoro, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you. Ed.